Every time we were together, it happened. Um, there was no night that went by that I was with him that he didn't sexually abuse me. We just had a wonderful relationship. I learned so much from him as an artist and as a kind human being. He's a good guy. He's a good guy? Yeah. Show me where he touched you. <laughs> No nonsense, no, 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 no shenanigans, no, but he's a Why was it important for you to stick up for him? Because he's always been a friend of me. That's what you do for friends, you tell the truth. Every time we were together, it happened. On May the 1st, 2013, Wade Robson filed the creditor's claim civil lawsuit against Michael Jackson's estate and companies for monetary compensation with claims of childhood sexual abuse by Michael Jackson. This was a shocker, because Robson previously had always defended the star against such allegations and denied that anything like that had ever happened to him. So what happened? In this film, we will lead you through the process of Robson's changing of his story, the circumstances surrounding it, and the legal proceedings in this case. Over the years, both as a child and as an adult, Wade had always defended Jackson privately and publicly alike, and often volunteered to do so. At no times did he give any hint of distress or confusion while talking about Jackson. He always seemed very open and genuine about their friendship. In 1993, when the Chandler allegations became public, the police contacted many families and their children who had spent time with Michael Jackson over the years, including the Robsons. Wade Robson, who at the time was 10 to 11 years old, and his mother or any of their family members never said anything incriminating about Jackson during that investigation. In fact, they defended him in a police interview and in a grand jury testimony. Yeah, you know, there's been different times where it'd just be me and Michael. Then there'd be other times where he has other friends over too. This is what, like what Brett said, it's just a slumber party. We just have a lot of fun. And you know, I've slept in the same bed as Michael. It's just you watch cartoons, you fall asleep. You know, it's just a friendship. And I know he would never do anything to hurt my brother. He's just, he's the nicest guy you've ever met. I've been there when uh, the, these kids have been in Michael's room. I've been there with them. It's just party time. They watch videos, they eat junk food, they play video games. They play so hard. They fall asleep. They're exhausted. They fall asleep. Yeah, There's from, nothing more to it than that. From your standpoint, does it seem unusual for a 34-year-old man to have kids sleeping over? Not when you know Michael's background. Under normal circumstances, possibly yes. But Michael, everybody knows he didn't have a childhood. In 2005, during the Gavin Arviso criminal trial, this time as an adult man, Robson continued to defend Jackson. He testified at the trial and denied ever having been sexually abused by Jackson. Robson continued to defend Jackson privately and publicly alike. Are you still friendly with Michael? Yeah, we still talk every couple months, catch up. You, you do, know? really? Yeah. Well, what's he like? What's he like? He's a good guy. He's a good guy? Yeah. Show me where he touched you. <laughs> you, you never, nothing ever, place he touched you, right? nothing ever like that? No, no, no nonsense, no, 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 no shenanigans? No, but no, he's no, a no. weird guy, you have to admit, right? You know what, at the end of the day, it's like, everybody's got something weird about him. Would look me in the eye, time and time again and tell me that nothing ever happened. He should have had an Oscar. He was very convincing. That was up until May the 8th, 2012, when he changed his story. So what happened? Why and how did Robson change his story after all those years of defending Jackson? His claim is that it was not until 2012 that he realized that Jackson had allegedly sexually abused him as a child. He does not claim repressed memories. He claims that he has always remembered what he now claims happened to him. Only he did not know until 2012 that it was sexual abuse and that it was wrong. This is a weird claim, considering that during the 2005 trial, Wade was already an adult man, and it was discussed everywhere how wrong such alleged acts would be and how there would be nothing consensual about sexual relations between a child and an adult. Another thing to consider is that when the Arviso allegations became public, just a couple of days later, Robson was asked about them in an interview, and he said, I never had that experience, and I hope that it never happened to anybody else. That sounds like a man who fully understood that a sexual relationship between a man and a child would be wrong. And please consider that, 
Among other things, Wade claims things like anal rape. He also offered other various contradictory claims about why he didn't tell his alleged truth until 2012. In one version, Jackson told him that both of them would go to jail if anyone found out, and Robson supposedly believed it until 2012. This seems to contradict the claim that he did not know if it was wrong until 2012. If it is something to go to jail for, then it is certainly something wrong. According to yet another version, that he told his mother Joy Robson, as per her deposition, he denied being abused at the 2005 trial because he felt shame about it. But Wade contradicted that in his own deposition. Question. When you testified at the criminal trial in 2005, did you feel a sense of shame of what had happened between you and Michael? Wade Robson. No, I didn't. I didn't have any. As I stated, I didn't have any perspective on it. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that at any, at any time, until post May 2012. Wade also made the claim that both in 1993 and in 2005, when he was already an adult man, Jackson had allegedly coached him on the phone in the form of a roleplay, and that supposedly made him a masterful liar, or a master of deception, as he put it, for more than two decades. What was this powerful roleplay that supposedly made Wade such a convincing liar, both as a child and an adult? Well, Jackson allegedly told Robson on the phone, they are making up all these lies about you and me, saying that we did all this disgusting sexual stuff. They are just trying to take us down, take away my power and my money, take away our careers. We can't let them do this. We have to fight them together. That's it. That is the sophisticated, powerful coaching and role-playing method that supposedly made Robson a masterful, Oscar-worthy liar for more than two decades. There is no claim that Jackson told Robson in a direct manner before his 2005 testimony what to say or how to testify on the stand. All Robson can claim is the supposed role-playing on the phone. Think about it. If Jackson had really molested Wade, it would have been incredible risk-taking on his part both in 1993 and 2005. To put this guy on the stand in 2005 as his first witness, and to rely on such lame supposed role plays, and hope not only that Wade would understand what Jackson wanted with those cryptic comments on the phone, but also that he would surely go along with it and would know exactly what to say. Wade Robson was my first witness in Michael Jackson's criminal trial. I started with one of my strongest witnesses for Michael Jackson, Wade Robson. He was adamant that he had never been touched, never been molested, never been abused, directly or indirectly. I called his mother and sister as witnesses to corroborate what he said, because they traveled on these tours too. And to have him suddenly reverse course so radically, years after Michael Jackson has passed away and can't speak up for himself, is outrageous. So I don't think he has a case. I think this is a money grab, like so much of Michael Jackson's unfortunate life. Uh, everybody would seem to have their hand out in one way or another. And I just think it's, it's ridiculous. Safe Chuck, I put in the same category. He didn't testify in the criminal trial, but he signed declarations. As oh, I, as he I, did. He as, did. As, as I recall, he signed declarations, made statements that he had never been touched. He explains his consistent, convincing denial of sexual abuse by describing himself as a master of deception. But was Wade Robson a master of deception all those years while he denied sexual abuse? Or is he a master of deception now? when he changed his story and filed a lawsuit amidst monetary demands. Once someone is a self-admitted master of deception, how do you decide when he's deceiving you? Because let's not forget, one is under oath and under a penalty of perjury, while testifying at a criminal trial and also while making a declaration or testifying at a deposition in a civil case. That means there is no way around it. Wade Robson is a proven liar who has no qualms about lying under oath and under a penalty of perjury. He either lied in 2005, or he's lying now, that he has changed his story and filed a lawsuit with monetary demands. On June the 25th, 2009, Michael Jackson passed away. Wade and his family mourned him, and they went to his public memorial. After Jackson's death, Wade had nothing but praise for Jackson, just like during his lifetime. In an exclusive book, the official Michael Jackson opus, that was published in 2009, 
Wade made an entry in which he wrote, among others, Michael Jackson changed the world, and more personally, my life forever. He is the reason I dance, the reason I make music, and one of the main reasons I believe in the pure goodness of humankind. He also participated in a tribute by Janet Jackson to her brother at the 2009 MTV Video Music Awards. Just had a wonderful relationship. I learned so much from him as an artist and as a kind human being. That he was a man, that he was a father. And that's what it's really about, is a father and his children. And he's a wonderful dad. And, uh, In November 2010, Wade and his wife Amanda had a son. A month later, in December, Wade was offered to direct the dance movie Step Up Revolution, and he accepted the offer. According to his court papers and a blog post he wrote in November 2017, he considered this as the fulfillment of Michael Jackson's prophecy to him as a child, that he would become a movie director of epic proportions, bigger than Steven Spielberg. In early 2011, Wade crumbled under the pressure of the job, which triggered a nervous breakdown in him, made him pull out of the project and left him purposeless. He wrote about it in a blog post in 2017. I was fulfilling Michael's prophecy, and then I blew it. Therefore, my entire life, I believed, had been in vain. On May 16, 2011, after his nervous breakdown due to the failed prophecy of him becoming a film director of epic proportions, Wade went into therapy. He did not make any allegations of childhood sexual abuse to his therapist or anyone at all. On May 21, 2011, so only five days after he started therapy, Wade wrote an email to the director of the Cirque du Soleil show begging him to let him direct and or choreograph Cirque's Michael Jackson-themed Las Vegas show called One. I always wanted to do this MJ show badly, Wade wrote in the email. Cirque du Soleil told Wade that he needed to be validated by Michael Jackson's state, so Wade met with John Branca, the executor of the Michael Jackson state. During John Branca's deposition in 2017, Wade's lawyer suggested that Wade was eventually hired to do the Cirque show. However, according to Branca, they decided that Jamie King was better qualified for the job and they picked him, rather than Wade. Branca speculated at one point in his deposition that it would be possible that as a director of the show, Jamie King might have hired Wade in some lower positions, such as a dancer, but he insisted that he was definitely not hired in a leading creative role, such as a director or a lead choreographer, that would be validated by the state. Despite of that, in the July 2011 interview, Wade talked about it as if he had the main role in doing the Cirque show. This was only a couple of months before he made his U-turn and first started making allegation against the star. Um, but uh, I'm starting on uh, Cirque du Soleil, Michael Jackson show, which is uh, you know exciting and terrifying all at the same time because it's such a huge uh, responsibility. Uh, but that was why I took it on. You know, Michael was such a huge part of my career and life. We were friends for 20 years before he passed, since I was seven. Um, so it's an opportunity for me to give back a little bit to, to, to his legacy. It's such a big part of his legacy and to, to make sure as much as I can that it's done right and that it really represents uh, his essence. In March 2012, about a year after his first breakdown, Wade suffered a second nervous breakdown. He went to a new therapist in April 2012, where he started an insight-oriented therapy. According to a story, about three weeks into the therapy, on May 8, 2012, he first started making allegations of child sexual abuse by Michael Jackson to his therapist or anyone at all. So what happened between Robson's first therapy in 2011 and his second in 2012? How did he come from praising Jackson and wanting to work on Cirque du Soleil's Michael Jackson show badly in 2011 to claiming childhood sexual abuse by Jackson in May 2012? Wade now claims what triggered his realization that he had allegedly been sexually abused by Jackson as a child was watching his one and a half year old son and imagining and visualizing him being sexually abused. 
Apparently, he needed to imagine and visualize his infant son being sexually abused to be able to muster up any emotion that he could build on his own story of alleged childhood sexual abuse. Mind you, visualizing things that he wanted to turn into reality was no stranger to Wade. In a 2002 interview, he said, Learn how to visualize. If you have a goal, you've got to visualize every little aspect of it. Every time I've done that wholeheartedly, it's always happened. It's never failed. Wade also claimed on his blog that what prompted him to confess to his therapist was a popular TED Talk by Brene Brown about the power of vulnerability. The talk is about the courage to be imperfect. It mentions how parents commit a mistake when they raise their children to be perfect, which echoes Wade's life, who by the age of 16 choreographed for international stars such as Britney Spears. The lecture seems more related to Wade's struggle with career expectations and his struggle to be perfect in his job from an early childhood than about sexual abuse. For a long time, he has struggled with the expectations and pressures of his job. He completely omitted this element from his lawsuit, but from his blog post that he has published in 2017 and 2018, after his lawsuit was tossed, we learn about these struggles in detail. Moreover, the therapist he went to in 2012, Dr. Larry Shaw, is a therapist whose focus is on people in high-pressure jobs. That this was Wade's real issue indeed is echoed in several blog posts he wrote in 2017 till 2018. In another blog post in April 2018, he reveals that he lost his fun in dancing and music when his career got to a level where high pressure to achieve and succeed started accompanying those activities. In yet another blog post in January of 2018, he reveals that it was the pressure to achieve and succeed that led to his nervous breakdowns. This is completely at odds with what he claims in his lawsuit as a reason for his breakdowns. He never mentioned these pressures and career struggles as the reason. Instead, he claims the reason for his breakdowns was his realization of alleged sexual abuse by Jackson and that show business was now associated with the sexual abuse for him because of that. Otherwise, he claims that his complaint, his career would have continued in an upward trajectory. As you have seen, this is quite simply not true based on his own blog where he admits that he had long struggled with unfulfillment in his work and the pressures and expectations of his job and that those pressures and expectations were the reason for his breakdowns. Moreover, his career crumbled way before he realized that he had allegedly been sexually abused. This means the whole premise of his lawsuit about his breakdowns being a result of sexual abuse is nothing but a lie. And it was a very convenient lie too. According to his mother, Joy Robson's testimony, he also had financial problems at the time. And then he suddenly realizes that he was allegedly sexually abused by Michael Jackson as a child. In his deposition and on his blog, Wade made claims that it was Jackson who taught him to always work hard and who was responsible for his unhealthy work attitudes from an early childhood. The reality is, however, that Wade's mother, Joy Robson, was a very ambitious stage mom and it was her who trained her kids to work hard from an early childhood. Wade made absolutely no mention of that in his lawsuit. My kids worked every weekend, every school vacation. Their birthday parties were backstage. Their Christmas parties were backstage. Mm. No regrets. Despite of clear evidence that it was Wade's mother who made her children work so hard, in Wade's new version of his life, it is Jackson who is made out to be the scapegoat for his unhealthy work attitudes. Jackson actually begged Wade's mother to let Wade have his childhood. Joy Robson herself testified to that in her 2016 deposition. She said that Jackson, quote, used to call me and ask and beg me not to make Wade work all the time, to let him have his childhood, end quote. Also from the 1995 article, as well as from the Robson's testimony in 2005, or Joy Robson's deposition in 2016, we learned that Jackson was actually hardly present in their life at the time. On top of Wade's career struggles and financial struggles at the time, he also had a marital crisis. According to his own deposition, his wife Amanda had a hard time handling his breakdowns and threatened to leave him. So this is the context in which Wade, as a quite convenient solution for all of his problems, suddenly realized that had allegedly been sexually abused by Michael Jackson as a child. 
This U-turn made it possible for him to sue Jackson's entities for money or to use his newfound story in other ways, like seeking a lucrative book deal. In a note that he wrote to himself that the Jackson State found out about and presented at his 2016 deposition, Wade stated, My story of abuse and its effects will make me relatable and relevant. There would also be a benefit in scapegoating someone else for his professional and personal problems and failures. With the claim of sexual abuse, Wade is suddenly seen as a victim, not as someone who failed in his profession and failed as the family breadwinner. The blame is shifted on someone else. Wade claimed that because of Jackson's alleged sexual abuse of him, he was no longer able to do any kind of entertainment activity because those activities were now too associated with Jackson and sexual abuse for him. He claimed that he could not dance, make music, make or even watch films anymore because of those activities association with Jackson. The fact is, however, that Wade continued to do all those activities, all the while claiming in court documents that he was so traumatized by such activities association with Michael Jackson that he would never be able to do them again, so he needed financial compensation. In September 2017 then, while his lawsuit was heading towards dismissal, he declared himself quote-unquote healed from the bad associations regarding entertainment activities and announced his return to the dance, choreography, and entertainment scene. So the alleged bad association and his inability to work were suddenly all gone when his lawsuit was close to dismissal. Wade filed a civil lawsuit against two of Jackson's companies, MJJ Productions and MJJ Ventures, also for monetary compensation. In the lawsuit, to get the monetary compensation he desired, Wade portrayed these companies as, start quote, the most sophisticated public child sexual abuse procurement and facilitation organization the world has known, end quote, that knowingly and deliberately facilitated his alleged sexual abuse. However, his own mother's deposition in 2016 inadvertently exposed Wade's allegations as lies. The Robsons, who were originally from Brisbane, Australia, first met Jackson in 1987 when he was on tour in Australia, and Wade, who was five years old then, won a dance competition at a Target store where the prize was to meet Michael Jackson. Wade alleged in his lawsuit, start quote, that the meet and greets were purposely orchestrated by MJJ Productions and MJJ Ventures as a sexual grooming mechanism to acquire minor sexual abuse victims for Michael Jackson, disguised as charitable events for minors, end quote. First of all, the meet and greet was not organized by either of Jackson's companies, but by Target, Pepsi, and CBS. Wade knows that too, since in his 2005 testimony, he himself made mention of Target organizing it. If it were up to Michael, their encounter would have ended there. It was Joy Robson who made further efforts to contact him. She, with her son, had delivered a thank you note to Jackson's hotel room a couple of days later, and as a result, they had another meeting with him for about an hour and a half. Again, this would have been the end of their encounters if it were up to Michael. Over the next few years, Joy Robson sent Jackson letters and videos about Wade's progress as a dancer, but they never heard back from the star. The next time they met or even talked to Jackson again was more than two years later in 1990 when, once again, it was the Robsons who sought contact with the star, not the other way around. How does this make the meet and greets, quote, a sexual grooming mechanism to acquire minor sexual abuse victims for Michael Jackson, as Wade alleges? According to Joy Robson's own story, it was Joy who initiated the contact with MJJ Productions, and her ultimate goal was, of course, to contact Michael Jackson. The reality is that after the Robsons moved to the USA, Jackson did not even spend much time with them, including Wade. In actuality, in her deposition, Joy Robson revealed that she had to be the one to pursue Jackson about calling Wade, putting him in projects such as his jam music video in 1992, and that Wade felt pushed aside a little bit because Jackson would rather spend time with other kids. Joy testified that one time she cut ties with Jackson for six months 
and that was for Jackson not calling Wade from the Dangerous Tour. Wade also wanted to go on tour with Jackson, but the star would not take him. Here we have to mention two other supposed witnesses for Wade whose stories he previously has denied. These people are ex-employees of Jackson who came out with claims of inappropriate behavior by the singer during the 1993 Chandler allegations and the accompanying tabloid media frenzy. They have been paid money by the tabloid media for their stories. One is Mark Quindoy, who worked for Jackson with his wife between 1989 and 1990. In the wake of the Chandler allegations in 1993, they sold stories to the tabloid media claiming that they quit because they were so disturbed by what they had allegedly witnessed Jackson do with children, including Wade. The thing is that the Quindoys gave media interviews about Jackson before the 1993 Chandler allegations as well. Before the 1993 allegations, the Quindoys talked about Jackson as a kind, shy man who was good with children. Their stories only changed when, in 1993, the tabloid media offered money for molestation stories about Jackson. Various journalists revealed that the Quindoys shopped their newfound stories for $250,000 to $900,000. The Quindoys also tried to shop around a book deal. Even tabloid journalists noted about the Quindoys that they found them to be completely untrustworthy. The other main witness of Wade is a maid called Blanca Francia, who worked for Jackson between 1986 and 1991. In 1993, in the wake of the Chandler case, she alleged that on one occasion she witnessed Jackson showering with a child, Wade Robson. Frankia was paid $20,000 by the tabloid TV show Hard Copy for her story, an amount that was more than her annual salary at the time. In her deposition in January 1994, Blanca Frankia admitted that she never saw or heard Wade Robson in the shower with Michael Jackson. She admitted that she only ever saw Jackson in the shower and she never saw a second figure with him. She also admitted that she never heard anyone else in the shower other than Jackson himself. Remember that in 2005, she testified that she saw them together in the shower, which makes her a liar under oath. So these are Wade's main witnesses. Wade also claimed that he filed his lawsuit to help Jackson's supposed other victims, but his treatment of those other alleged victims was certainly inconsistent with that. In his deposition, Wade admitted that he never attempted to reach out to Gavin Arvizo, the boy at the center of the 2005 trial. So despite of his claim that he filed his lawsuit not for money, but as some sort of advocacy for Jackson's other victims, he never bothered to reach out and apologize to the boy whose justice Wade obscured, if we believe the current version of his story that he had falsely testified at that trial. He also aggressively pursued Jonathan Spence, a man who befriended Jackson in the 1980s as a child. Spence never accused Jackson of any wrongdoing and he still says that Jackson never did anything wrong to him. He also approached Brett Barnes, another man who befriended Jackson as a child and always maintained that Jackson never molested him. When Robson's allegations became public in May 2013, Barnes tweeted, I wish people would realize, in your last moments on this earth, all the money in the world will be of no comfort. My clear conscience will. We shot for a year, um, and I was 10, 11 in that time frame, and then I also continued to be friends with him for about a decade. He just had this unconditional love. He was so pure. A lot of the general public just didn't treat him well. You know, just treated everybody with such dignity and respect and just loved everything and everybody. Well, he was the big brother I never had, quite honestly. Um, he was everything to me as a kid. He taught me so many things. He's taught me about loving animals, vegetarianism, uh, animal rights, environmental issues, caring about your fans. Uh, he was... He was almost a metaphorical hero, and he was also a literal hero. Mm. It was almost, he was almost, metaphorically, he was almost like a father that I never had. Basically, he befriended me. He took me into his life, which is very rare for Michael to do, but he opened up his arms to me and accepted me as a very good friend of his. And throughout the years, he never let me go. So I went with my whole family, and next you know, like, we were friends. We were like, Seriously, he was like like my best friend growing up for like a, like a good fat stretch of really? my life. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it's it was it was legitimate friendship. Yeah. I sat there and I gave them the names. 
They're on record. They have all of this information, but they were scanning Michael Jackson. All they cared about was trying to find something on Michael Jackson. Who you said, by the way, did not abuse who you. Who Michael was innocent, and that was what the interview was about with the police in 1993. I told them, he is not that guy. And they said, well, maybe you just don't understand your friend. And I said, no, I know the difference between pedophiles and somebody who's not a pedophile because I've been molested. Here's the names. Go investigate. Uh, later and on, of course, um, after he died, a few of those people came forward and said, you know, it never happened. We didn't do anything. We was pressured by parents, by this or that. And when they needed money real bad, and they figured that was a way to get, you know, get at them. But it's a little late, you know what I mean? Thanks a lot. You know what I mean? You put him through hell and... You know, he's always been nothing but a great friend, not just to me, to my own, my own family. We grew up with him literally since he was three and I was five. And he really just was so humble and then never really played off on the fact that he was, you know, this Michael Jackson. You know, he was just uh, Michael. He's just our friend. Robin, in all of these pages, hundreds of pages, many, many hours of investigation, going to the Philippines, going to Chicago, going all over the country, there's not one scrap of evidence that Michael Jackson ever harmed a child, did anything wrong, committed any crime. It's almost a vindication when you look at this. The FBI looked at all of these matters and said, there's nothing here. And I think that's the most startling thing which I've seen.